everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDOP and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the series on behalf of CERDOP and ESCCP. Today's webinar will consist of a brief overview of both programs, followed by the technical portion of the webinar on PFAS toxicity and best practices for PFAS ecological risk assessments. We'll get started with Dr. Marisol Supoveda of Purdue University, who will discuss her work on quantifying the toxicity of different PFAS for amphibians native to the US in order to support ecological risk assessments. Marisol's presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. We will then move on to Dr. Jason Condor of Geosyntec, who will summarize his, word, his work to develop guidance for assessing the ecological risks from PFAS to threatened and endangered species. The guidance that he developed provides clear steps to quantitatively evaluate ecological risks and enable site managers to make defensible risk-based management decisions using best available information and approaches. Jason's presentation will also be followed by a brief Q&A session and we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session featuring both of our speakers. For today's webinar, we are using Zoom as the online platform. Zoom recently updated their security settings. We therefore recommend that you download a free copy of Zoom at zoom.us slash download. If you are unable to download Zoom, you can view the slides using an internet browser, and that information was made available to you uh, in an email from Zoom this morning. You can either create a Zoom account uh, to, um, an, at zoom.us slash sign up. Uh, if you do, please use a compatible browser with Zoom. Firefox, IE, or Edge are the best webinars um, browsers. And then you can view the webinar um, by using the webinar ID shown on this slide. If you are having technical difficulties with the material not showing up on your screen, or if your screen freezes, you can do a hard refresh by keying in Control and F5. Uh, on slide seven, we are providing additional instructions for accessing the webinar. Uh, if you want to connect to your computer audio versus calling in, just click the arrow next to the Join Audio button, select Test Speaker and Microphone, and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you experience difficulties with the audio, you have the option to call in um, using the conference line. There are several phone numbers available, but you have to enter the required webinar ID shown here, and again, provided to you in an email from Zoom this morning if you registered. And then on slide eight, if you continue to have technical difficulties, you have other options. Two specifically, you can go to the webinar webpage for today's webinar and download a PDF of the slides. Uh, and then call into the conference line, which is just a, a phone call away. You don't need a browser. And then you can follow the presentation using uh, the PDF. Uh, but also, please uh, be aware that we are live streaming the webinar on the CERTUP and ESCCP YouTube channel. And the link is youtube.com slash user slash CERTUP ESCCP, all one word. All right. With that, we're going to go ahead and get started here. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrea Leeson, who is the Deputy Director of CERDUP in ESCCP, as well as the Program Manager for the Environmental Restoration Program area, the subject of today's webinar. Dr. Leeson has been with CERDUP and ESCCP since 2001, and prior to that, she was a research leader at the Battelle Memorial Institute where she conducted scientific research on in-situ bioremediation and the design and implementation of innovative biological, chemical, and physical treatment technologies for site remediation and industrial wastewater. 
Andrea received her doctoral degree in environmental engineering from the Johns Hopkins University. Andrea? Thank you, Rula, and thanks everyone for joining this webinar today. Before we jump into the heart of the webinar, I'd just like to give you a little information about who CERTIP and ESTCP are. We are DOD's environmental technology programs, and these are sister programs with CERTIP. It is primarily our research and development program. We have been around since 1991, and we operate in conjunction with the EPA and the Department of Energy. ESTCP is our demonstration and validation program. This is where we can take the knowledge and the technologies that are developed out of CERTIP or other research programs, and once they mature, they can go into ESTCP so those technologies can be demonstrated and validated in the field at actual sites. We have some environmental drivers that guide the sort of research we do, and just briefly, I'll touch on this, that first is we are looking to develop technologies for sustaining our ranges, facilities, and operations. This involves a very broad array of issues from sustainable forward operating bases to noise and maritime sustainability, UXO and munitions constituents. We also are concerned with reducing the current and future liability, and that can be from contamination from past practices, such as anything that impacts our groundwater, soils, and sediments, as well as dealing with some of the emerging contaminants and chemicals of concern that are coming out. And certainly today's webinar will address some of those issues that we have. We also are concerned with pollution prevention to control life cycle costs. And this is eliminating hazardous materials or processes in our manufacturing, maintenance, and operation facilities. The cornerstone of what we do at CERTIP and ESTCP is our technology transfer so that the technologies and the knowledge we develop under these programs can be used by end users and other people in the field who need to have this new technology. And so we develop a wide variety of techniques and tools to try to transition the technologies we develop. Certainly these webinars that we are hosting are a key part of that, but if you go to our website, you can find a wide number of other materials available, different videos. We often host in-person trainings, guidance manuals, et cetera. There is a lot available on our website. Shown here is a list of some of the upcoming webinars. We generally have roughly about two a month, and if you are interested in particular in some of the PFAS work that we're doing, you can see here that we have a couple of additional webinars coming up over the next couple of months that'll deal with some of the technologies we're working on for PFAS treatment, bait, and transport. If you go to the website shown on this page, you'll be able to see all of the upcoming webinars for coming up over the year, and you can also register for those webinars at this time. So at this time, Rula, I'll turn it back over to you for the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Andrea. Um, it is now uh, time to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Marisol Sepulveda, who is a professor of ecotoxicology and aquatic animal health in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Sciences at Purdue University. Uh, Marisol's research focuses on understanding the effects and toxicity mechanisms of emerging contaminants. Her laboratory utilizes several models including cells, invertebrates, fish, and amphibians, to evaluate ecologically relevant effects at the whole animal, subcellular, and molecular scales. Marisol earned her veterinary degree from the University of Chile in Santiago and her master's and doctoral degrees from the University of Florida in wildlife ecology and toxicology, respectively. Marisol, please proceed. Okay, thank you, Rula. Um, thanks everybody for attending our webinar series today. The title of my presentation is Bioaccumulation and Toxicity of PFAS in Amphibians. So this is a, an agenda of what I'm going to cover. First, I'm going to briefly talk about PFAS in aquatic environments, how they basically move from a F site to uh, aquatic systems. Then I'll present to you some of our own data on bioaccumulation and effects of PFAS in, on amphibians. And I'll end with 
some um, points related to the relevance of our research to DOD efforts, as well as some benefits of our research to end users in general. So in this diagram, we see that AFFS um, or Equus firefighting foams are uh, released into the environment for, from different sources. A major one are fire training areas at military and civilian facilities. Uh, however, there's other, other types of, of sources of AFFF and thus PFAS to the environment, including things like a sites with past emergency response incidents or accidental releases of AFFF from storage tanks, et cetera. Uh, once these chemicals are in the environment, they can move through different processes, including atmospheric deposition, uh, things like diffusion and dispersion, infiltration. And for the purposes of my talk, the importance of this diagram here is that they ultimately, many of them reach aquatic environments where uh, aquatic organisms, invertebrates, plants, vertebrates live. So our, our research, the goal of our research is to mostly understand what are the ecological impacts of these chemicals to aquatic animals. So in a simple food chain, like shown here, PFAS are going to move uh, from the water to the sediment, sometimes binding to organic matter in that sediment, and from there are going to move up the food chain starting from primary producers such as algae, um, which are consumed by primary consumers, things like soil plankton, insects, even vertebrate larvae such as amphibians. And from there into secondary consumers, larger invertebrates such as crayfish, um, things like turtles, small fish that prey on soil plankton and plants. And finally, making it to tertiary consumers, uh, larger fish that eat other fish, such, such as largemouth bass and other sport uh, game fish, of course, fishing in birds and, and humans. So uh, here is some data that we've collected over the last couple years from a site in Michigan. Uh, the site is called Clark's Marsh and it's associated with uh, Wordsmith Air Force Base. So it's an area that it's known uh, to be contaminated with PFAS coming from AFFF use. And what I'm showing you here is basically coll a collection of, of data. Uh, here in the y-axis, uh, we have the concentration of different PFAS in parts per billion dry weight. Uh, we've looked at about 24, but we've detected about half of them. And as you can see, there's an increase in the concentration of these chemicals as we go up into, uh, move up into, uh, the, hurry up in the food chain from uh, primary producers, like I showed you earlier, all the way to fish. Um, this the data that we've collected so far matches pretty well with what others have reported uh, in that C8 chemi uh, chemicals or PFASs that have a chain length of um, eight carbons and such as perfluorooctane sulfonic acid or PFOS are bioaccumulating the highest that's shown here in kind of red of uh, dark orange. Uh, other, other PFAS are also uh, accumulating to, to, but to a lesser degree. Here, for example, PFHXS or perfluorohexane sulfonic acid, which is um, way below PFOS. And then there are other PFAS that are not bioaccumulating at all. So it's important to understand this bioaccumulation right in the environment, as um, I'll show you in, in, in the next slide, because we uh, for the most part, I believe, right, that this is true for many other chemicals as well, that the higher the bioaccumulation, the higher the toxicity. What we're finding with our data is that that's not necessarily true. We have effects with chemicals like these fluorotelomeres that are not, um, not shown here, but they're, they're not bioaccumulating, or even PFA, which is uh, shown here in, in this light blue, that are still causing effects. Uh, so basically, there's a need then to study and to understand the toxicity uh, and the ecological implications of PFAS in aquatic environments. Our survey project, which started in 2016, has been focused on understanding the toxicity of these chemicals to an understudied taxa, taxonomic group, which are the amphibians. Amphibians, as you know, utilize both aquatic and terrestrial habitats throughout their biphasic life cycle. 
and that there are potentially at high risks of exposure to these chemicals, as they can be exposed during larval stages, mostly through their gills um, and their skin, but also in their terrestrial forms because they have a very thin permeable skin. So they can be exposed both during both uh, life stages. Specifically, we were tasked with developing toxicity reference values or TRVs for this vertebrate group with the ultimate goal of supporting ecological risk assessment of PFAS in AFFF contaminated uh, defense, restora uh, defense environmental restoration program sites. So over the last several years, we have conducted a, a large number of experiments focused on three main uh, species of amphibians shown here, the northern leopard frog, the eastern tiger salamander, and the American toad. We chose these species for several reasons. Uh, first, they're widespread throughout North America. Uh, they can be obtained from the wild relatively easily uh, and cultivated in the laboratory. They represent three major taxonomic uh, groups within amphibians. So the frog, the salamanders, and the toads, which have differences in, <clears throat> they're different in many respects, uh, ecologically, biologically, physiologically. For instance, they, uh, the three species shown here have different uh, developmental periods. So for, for instance, the frog and, and the toad develop much faster than the salamander, for example. Uh, other differences are that the salamander is much more uh, predatory and cannibalistic even uh, than the other two species. We then chose four different PFAS shown here, PFOA, PFOS, both C8. One of them has a sulfonate um, um, power group and the other one has a carboxylic power group. And then we also chose two uh, shorter chain PFAS, PFHXS and 6,2-fluorotelomere sulfonate. Uh, our hypotheses at the beginning of our work were that C8 compounds would be more biocumulative and more toxic than C6 compounds. We also chose three different concentrations of course of control and three additional concentrations of these chemicals that span a range uh, of a very over a thousand parts per billion, which would be a, a worst case scenario. That's a very high concentration to a 10 part per billion concentration, which is and the upper limit of what uh, some of these AFFF sites have reported. We have been working with different life stages from tadpoles, which are fully aquatic, to subadult metamorphs or juveniles, which are terrestrial. So exposure routes uh, differ between these life stages as we, we mimic those, uh, mostly aqueous exposures to, uh, for tadpoles, as well as dermal and food or oral exposures for the metamorphs. So in this slide here, I'm showing you some examples of, of or some pictures basically of the different expo experiments that we conducted. Um, the acres exposures with tadpoles, we've done experiments spiking sediments and exposing tadpoles through the sediment instead of through the water only. And then we, uh, we have done exposures where we expose the animals thermally by spiking their substrate, like shown here is vacuum moss. And then we've also conduct, conducted experiments exposing salamanders orally to these chemicals by first exposing their diet, which in this case are crickets, to the chemicals and then feeding those uh, animals to the salamanders. So one of the uh, important findings from our work so far is that um, these tadpoles uh, or tadpoles in general are accumulating these chemicals very quickly and much more so than um, other aquatic organisms like fish. So in, in, these, uh, in this graph here, in these two sets of graphs, I'm showing you um, basically two of, results from two of the species that we tested. I, I'm not showing you salamanders to make it a little bit simpler. Here on the left panel, I'm showing you the data for PFOA and on the right panel for PFOA. The top panels are again, leopard frogs at the bottom are American toads. We expose these animals for 10 days and sample them uh, to either 10 or 1,000 ppv, and we sample them every 48 hours. So the, the take-home message of this, of this data, and here I'm showing you not the body burn, but, but the log of 10 of the bioconcentration factor. The take-home message is that these animals reach 
steady state very quickly. Um, that's much uh, more obvious here for PFOS than it is for PFOA. But if, I, if you see the body burden data, the, the patterns are very similar. They reach steady state in about 48 to 96 hours. And that's, again, much quicker than or faster than has been reported for other aquatic organisms. Another important uh, set of data that we've collected uh, in the last couple of years is shown on this slide. There's a lot of important points that I want to uh, bring from this slide. The first is that, uh, well, what I'm showing you here is the exposure, the bioconcentration factors and bioaccumulation factors in the case of the um, the metamorphs or terrestrial forms for our aquatic, dermal, and dietary exposures. For the four PFAS that I mentioned earlier, at three different concentrations. These experiments uh, for the aqueous exposures were done for all three species, as well as the dermal was, was done for all three species. The dietary experiment was only done with eastern tiger salamanders. These are very long-term experiments, uh, difficult to conduct because remember, these animals were collected as eggs from the environment, but we had to basically grow them until they metamorphosed and then start experiments. So these experiments are several months long um, and they're difficult to conduct. So the first take home message from this data is that larva aquatic um, uh, amphibians are accumulating these chemicals at a much higher rate than metamorphs or juveniles exposed thermally and orally. Particularly, the animals that are exposed thermally are basically not bioaccumulating much at all um, from, from these exposures. Uh, and the, like, the, the, the fact that these tadpoles are accumulating very quickly is probably a combination of quick uptake through the gills and the skin at the same time. The other important finding is that basically PFAS, again, is coming up as the highest um, uh, PFAS in terms of bioaccumulation. And this is very clear here from the tadpole data. Uh, but the three species are behaving very similarly. That's true for almost all the, the experiments that we've done. So the species are, 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 except here, we don't have a comparison, but for these two exposure routes, they're behaving very similarly. So that's uh, an important finding. And the other finding that I wanted to uh, show here that's in very interesting is the fact that some of these chemicals like the 6 or sulfonase shown here in blue, it's actually disappearing or degrading. We don't know exactly why, uh, how this is happening. We have uh, data that shows uh, that we can detect approximately 100 or more different metabolites from this compound. Uh, we don't know exactly how this is happening. We, we think it's a combination of internal metabolism by the animals and some um, degradation from environmental bacteria. Now, so far I've just shown you bioaccumulation or update, uh, uptake data. So what about effects? So this slide here, uh, again, lots of data points to show. Uh, briefly, what I'm showing you here is scale mass, mass, index, mass index, which is a, an in, uh, a, a way to evaluate body condition in amphibians. Um, it's been shown to be a good, uh, to be a good uh, estimate of body condition, and it's basically uh, calculated by regressing the natural log of the body mass in relation to the natural log of the, of the snout bent length. And we calculate basically um, scale components uh, based on by species and also based on um, the control animals only, not to bias our results. So you see here, again, the three concentrations tested, the three species, salamanders, uh, toads, and frogs, and the effect on scale mass index for these chemicals. This is the control group. And the one thing that stands out right away is that there are differences between species here, right? So the toads seem to be very resistant. There's really not much going on compared to the frog, and in particular the frog, and some effects in the salamanders as well. The tendency, of course, is for a decline in this, in this body condition with exposure. The other interesting pattern that comes up 
uh, that, that it's worth mentioning here is that remember I showed you some data, bioaccumulation data earlier and PFOS is always up higher than anything else. Well, effects are not necessarily seen only with PFOS and actually PFOS is not the most toxic uh, if we examine this type of endpoint. Indeed, it's it maybe perhaps even this chlorotelomere here that's degrading and um, that's causing more effects. Uh, are, is it the parent compound or is it are the, the metabolites that are being formed? That that remains to be to be um, elucidated. We don't we don't know the answer to that at this point. So another area of interest for us has been the idea that um, that experiments that are conducted in in the indoors, very controlled experiments, are not necessarily um, predictive or very uh, realistic in terms of evaluating effects. And this is not just true for PFAS research, this is true for toxicological or ecotoxicological research in general. So um, we have been conducting experiments where we actually expose these animals under more semi-natural conditions in what we call mesocosms. So these are large uh, 180 liter tanks that are basically seeded at the beginning of the season um, and basically seeded with things like soil plankton and um, things like that and allowed to, uh, to, accum to acclimate for a while before animals um, are being um, stocked in these uh, systems. We have exposed, uh, in, the, in these setups, we have exposed leopard frogs for up to 30 days and we have been examining effects on survival, growth and development. So here's an, uh, some data from one of the experiments that we co conducted a year, a couple of years ago. Uh, on the left, we see the concentrations of both PFOS and PFOA in the water, sediment, and tadpoles. And on the left, on the right panel, you see the effects on stage. Uh, GS refers to Gosner stage, which is a typical way of uh, assessing development throughout uh, the larval stages as the animals undergo metamorphosis. So our animals always, were, or we start our experiments with Gosner stage around 26. And then at the end of the exposure period, we look at how much they developed. And as you can see from this data, we see that animals exposed to PFOS uh, are about one and a half stages behind the control. Uh, we see some effects with P4 at the, at the intermediate dose, but not as pronounced as we see with P4. Uh, and an important thing to point out from this data is that our, our effects uh, with P4 are seen with water concentrations of 0 0.06 parts per billion, which is very, very low considering uh, com compared to, um, to what we have observed in other experiments that are being conducted indoors. So if we, if we compare uh, an indoor uh, aqueous uh, lab exposure here to the left, to, one, to the data that I just showed you, uh, it's very obvious that uh, the animals, again, were started at the same stage, but they developed a lot less in, in, inside um, under control conditions compared to outside, and, um, and there were no effects. So, of course, this is, we're not exactly sure why the differences are so pronounced, but, it, but it's basically uh, telling us that the mesocosm experiments are perhaps a much more realistic way of evaluating effects due to these chemicals and more, more experiments uh, of this type need to be conducted. We've also begun some studies looking at mixtures. This study here was, uh, was conducted in 2017 or 16. And we used a different species of frog here. This is the American bullfrog. And we looked at um, mixtures, in this case, only a very simple binary mixture of P4, P4 and PFOS at two different concentrations. Those correspond to 0.1% of the LC50, 144 PPV, and 0.2% of the LC50. So very low concentrations overall. And we see that, um, that PFOS is really driving the toxicity in this case, we see effects at both levels. Uh, again, development, delay in development. We see effects of PFOA and PFOS um, that are 
appear to be additive as there's no interaction between these chemicals as we increase in concentration. And, um, and on, uh, in relation to the, to the mixture uh, experiments, we've also, because of the results of this one that I just showed you, we expanded on this um, area of research. And last year, we replicated both in the, in the laboratory and in, under a mesocosm setup a mixture of PFAS, uh, sort of replicating what one would find in an AFFF site. So we use data from our own, uh, our own Clark's marsh, marsh, which I showed you earlier, plus a data, data that was published by Anderson et al., where they actually reported uh, PFAS concentrations from 10 unknown Air Force bases. And one can see from this data that about 95% uh, of the water concentration is, is of these mixtures is, is based on only on five different PFAS shown here. Uh, PFOS, PFOA, PFHXS, PFHXA, and PFPEA. And so what we did last year is we sort of replicated this mixture and um, and also the main difference that we had last year is that we exposed these animals throughout metamorphosis. So some of these experiments lasted over 120 days. And on this table, um, I am showing you the, the treatments. And basically what we wanted to answer was, is PFOS driving these effects? So we had two, two concentrations here, low and high for PFOS uh, of four and 10 ppv. And then we had a mixture with, with PFOS that uh, at the highest concentration of 10 ppv that included all the other uh, four PFAS, and then two that didn't. So unfortunately, I'm not gonna have time to show you some of this data. Uh, hopefully, uh, it will be coming up soon. But uh, the point that I wanted to make here is that the concentrations that we're seeing, that, that we found from this mesocosm experiment were actually very similar to what we detected in Clark's Marsh. So Clark's Marsh here shown in this uh, gray circle and uh, our purple triangle here showing our own data for water, sediment, and amphibians. PFOA was a little bit off, but not, not um, but overall, I think we have a very good um, concordance between both areas, both types of uh, sites or studies. So to conclude, um, I wanted to uh, also let you know that we've been working with a collaborator, Anne Christine Catlin from Purdue, uh, we have an NSF grant together, and we've been building this um, web-based platform, platform where we've been in, uh, in, include or uploading all of our certified toxicity data. And here's the link. I encourage you to go look at it. And there's some tutorials that explain how our platform is working. And we hope to be able to one day soon have all of our data um, in, uploaded there. So in conclusion, we see rapid bioaccumulation and deprivation of PFAS by larva, uh, it's highest for PFOS. Um, these chemicals are not very overtly toxic, so more toxicity occurs at very high PPM levels. Uh, the effects on growth and development are species and chemical de uh, dependent, and there's some evidence for effects on body conditions started at, uh, starting at the lowest con uh, concentration tested of 10 ppv. Mesocosms also delayed development uh, and at concentrations of, in the case of PFOS that are, much, that are very low. Binary mixtures of PFOS and PFOA appear to act additively. We have effective well, way of simulating field exposures and um, we believe that some AAA impacted sites could pose risk to amphibians. Um, amphibians, of course, are used for sentinel species for assessing ecosystem health and we, we uh, believe that our research will help assess ecological risk of PFAS at DOD AFFF impacted sites. And with that, I would like to finish, acknowledge my co-PIs, Dr. Jason Hooverman and Linda Lee, and everybody else listed on the slide, too many to name, that have been essential um, in conducting all the research I just presented. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary Sol. I would like to remind you to please submit questions using the Q&A box on your screen. The chat box should be reserved uh, for alerting us of technical difficulties. We have received several questions on the first portion of the presentation that Marisol will now answer. Um, Marisol, can you please uh, let us know 
if the lack of by accumulation of the shorter chain PFAS versus the longer chain C8 and above compounds is due to the organism's ability to expel them or break them down? Well, there's no evidence that these, except for the fluoroctelomere, that these chemicals are being metabolized by vertebrates in, in general, at least not the ones that we've worked with. So that would not be a, a possibility. And um, so there's the evidence suggests that these larger chains, C8 and higher, are um, more likely to bind to things like proteins. That's the reason why they bioaccumulate at higher rates than lower chain compounds. But again, there's no evidence that they're being metabolized. Thank you. And this is a question from the Navy. In your mycocosm studies, did you look at the final concentration in all media to evaluate the mass balance? Yes, we've done, uh, and I, I'm not sure which, so there's two mesocosm studies that I presented. The first one is actually a paper that just came out, and um, if, if this person is interested, I can send him or her the link. Uh, we did look at concentrations at the beginning, and I believe at the end of the study, um, and uh, I, I, I believe that we have, but not in that paper, that we did conduct a mass balance, yes, and I'll be happy to talk uh, about that with this person more specifically, uh, yes. Great, William, I'd encourage you to contact Marisol. Um, her contact information is available on slide 42, Laura, if you can pull that up and she would provide that paper to you. All right, next question is from Simon Fraser University. Uh, have you been able to investigate if there is a hormetic response in the study that you described on slide 28? And perhaps we could pull up slide 28 up. Um, let me see, hormetic response in terms of like seeing effects at low doses but not higher doses. I'm not exactly sure why this, um, there would be a hormetic response. Um, I, I think that basically uh, it's possible that the animals are responding, um, you know, to, to basically what, this is one thing that we, we do see that, that could maybe, there's a reason why this person is asking this question is that we don't see a dose response here in most cases, right? So you would expect to see higher effects at higher doses, but that's not necessarily the case. And so we do see effects at low doses, like shown here with the frog data, that appear um, to be, to be uh, not, you know, perhaps driven by uh, a stress type of response that is not necessarily chemically driven. But we have, uh, we have, we would have to conduct more studies to to be able to discern that at this point. And we are testing much lower doses. I. I I didn't mention that, but the lowest dose in our most recent experiment was uh, half the PPD, I believe, for one of the chemicals. So, so that's something that we're definitely trying to understand better. Thank you, Mary. So the next question is from the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. Um, are you aware of a timeline for developing the TRVs? A timeline, so I guess the question is when are, when are these values going to be available for use? I think that there's still quite a bit of research. I, I, I see our research as a, a one uh, piece of the big puzzle that needs to be put together before, before these values are actually, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, are, are, are able to be used for ecological risk assessment. We have data that is uh, very specific to certain species, right, and to certain conditions. So uh, unfortunately for amphibians, there's really not much more data than what we've collected. Uh, and so our data is very valuable in that sense, but I think that there's still quite a bit of research that needs to be done before these uh, values can be uh, considered uh, for potential ecological risk assessment. Thank you, Marisol. 
This is a question or two questions from EPA Region 2. First, have you calculated any bioaccumulation or bioconcentration factors? And does total organic carbon, carbon in sediment impact the bioavailability of PFOS and PFOA? Yes, we have calculated bioconcentration and bioaccumulation factors. Again, we published um, last year and, this, and earlier this year a few papers with all the data that I've shown you. Most of the data that I show you today has been published. Um, so those values are in the papers. And then do we know if organic matter uh, decreases bioavailability of PFAS? Uh, those are important studies that need to be done. We, we think that they do, and there's some evidence that they do based on previous studies uh, with invertebrates, earthworms in particular. So there's a good chance that they, that's happening, but we don't have, in our studies, we didn't, we didn't uh, vary the organic matter. So I can't answer that from our own data at this point. Thank you, Marisol. Uh, another question from EPA. Uh, did you also look at thyroid hormones specifically? Yeah, that's an area that we're uh, definitely investigating at the minute. Um, I don't have any, I didn't include any of that in this talk, just mostly because of lack of, of time. But the differences or the effects on development in particular and um, growth are potentially driven by thyroid, thyroid disruption. But because, and because we know these chemicals um, can induce thyroid disruption based on other studies, we are very interested in understanding that in our, in, in our model animals, in our amphibians. So we, don't, we are investigating it currently, but we can't say that that's what they are doing at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a question. Uh, from the state of New Jersey, um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, read it to you here. Why did you choose 10 micrograms per liter as your lowest concentration? Well, when we started our, our project four years ago, we, we wanted to basically, we, it, this is a hard question to, to answer because it's always, better to have more concentrations than, than less, right? To be able to get a good idea of, of the dose response. However, our experiments, like I mentioned earlier, in particular with the metamorphs, are difficult to conduct. So we have only a limited number of doses we can test. So 10 parts per billion seemed to us like a reasonable num concentration. Again, it would be a worst case scenario in, in these AFFF sites, which is what we're interested in, in, in evaluating the most. It would be a high concentration everywhere, anywhere else. Uh, I understand that. And that's the reason why in our latest experiments, we've decreased that dose quite a bit and below one PPV. So we're in a much more uh, re relevant level, uh, you know, outside an AFFF site even. So that was the reasoning behind the, 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 the way we, you know, we chose um, those concentrations. Thank you so much. Um, we're at 31 questions received here, so we're not going to get through all of them now. We'll save some to the final Q&A session. But one more question for you, Marisol, before we transition to Jason. This is a question from the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Can you comment or provide more information about your depuration rate and let us know if that data is published and available. Yes, yeah, so the first paper we published, this is a 2017 paper by Hoover et al. We actually did study depuration of um, leopard frogs and uh, calculated half-lives of about 48 hours, uh, very similar to the, to the amount that it takes them to, to reach steady state. And that, that's been published. We did not do this with, um, and that was true for all four PFAS that we, we studied. Um, we have not done that with the other two species of, of amphibians. 
Great. Thank you, Mary Sol. And for the author of that question, Shannon, please contact Mary Sol directly and she will let you know how to get a copy of that paper. All right. At this point, we're going to transition to our second speaker today, who is Dr. Jason Conder. Jason is a principal at Geosynta Consultants in Huntington Beach, California. He has more than 15 years of experience in environmental toxicology, ecological and human health risk assessment, bioaccumulation and bioavailability of environmental contaminants, environmental chemistry, environmental monitoring technology, and statistics. Jason has a bachelor's degree, bachelor's degree in wildlife ecology and a master's degree in zoology from Oklahoma State University. And his doctoral degree is in environmental science from the University of North Texas. Jason, please proceed. All right, thank you, Rula. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the decision-making process for ecological risks at AFFF sites. What do we do when we come down to using science and policy to make decisions at sites? And to kind of help CERTIP, DOD, start to tackle this problem, we put together an ecological risk assessment guidance specifically for evaluating PFOS at AFFF sites. And what I'm going to do in the rest of my presentation today is talk through some of the objectives and benefits of the guidance and then give everyone a high level overview of the guidance and, and other things that we're doing to, to basically socialize and get the guidance out there. So Marisol did a great job of introducing AFFF, so I won't spend too much time on this slide. My main point here is though that uh, there are really hundreds to thousands of sites out there that, that could be impacted with AFFF. Many of them offer ecological habitats and that's going to basically require at many of those sites, an ecological risk assessment of some sort to understand the need for additional investigation, management, and what have you. And I will say that ecological risk is driving decisions at sites in the US, Australia, and other places that are looking at these sorts of issues. So when it comes down to an actual AFFF, Groundwater, and there's a wide range of behaviors um, for the PFOS that we're working with. Some can absorb the soil and aquatic sediment, as Marisol mentioned. Some are a little bit more soluble in water. And basically, these sites, uh, a lot of them are at airports or, or right adjacent to airfields. They're usually managed ecosystems with mowed grass or paved areas with gravel. They're right next to a runway. So there's not a lot of ecological habitat at many of these locations. Um, when it comes down to actual exposures at these sorts of spots, it's usually not a, a really issue in terms of managing exposure, but managing the source. Because the real uh, you know, risk potential with these sites are when these compounds um, move down gradient in aquatic ecosystems in particular as they follow the water, surface water, stormwater transport pathways. And so really the objectives of what we put together in the guidance is, is really to try to put this information out there into best practices guidance. Um, we didn't want it to be just another catalog or, or review paper. Um, there are already several good ones of those already out there. Um, but at the same time, it's not quite time for the Ten Commandments of Eco Risk. We don't quite know everything. Our knowledge isn't perfect. We wanted to something put something out there that straddled the middle, straddled the spectrum here, and really kind of gave us an idea of what, what's the current best approach for ecological risk assessment? What's, what's the best available information out there uh, for sites where we need to start making decisions? So by the numbers, the guidance is available now. It's a 60-page document with five appendices. It's uh, really the heart and soul of it is the recommended values that one would use for an ecological risk assessment document. These are the traditional bioaccumulation values for aquatic biota and terrestrial biota that ecological risk assessors to need to build up a food web model. Uh, their toxicity reference values, aquatic life criteria, and soil criteria to use and effects characterization steps of the risk assessment, really what 
exposures or, or triggering potential um, you know, concern. And this information was put together by really a, really a comprehensive and thorough review of, of over 250 studies. We considered over 200 toxicity values and, and over 1,300 bioaccumulation values in putting this information together. One of the first challenges that we had in, in really getting our arms around um, what to put into a guidance is which PFOS to work with. Um, you know, there are many different types of PFOS compounds out there in the environment, definitely at AFFF sites. We settled on a target list of 18 PFOS uh, for collection of data and, and evaluation in the guidance. And it's mostly the stable uh, carboxylic and sulfonic acids, the PFCAs, the PFSAs like PFOA and PFOS. We also have three commonly detected precursors that associated with some of these sites. And this review is based on really what's available in e EPA 537.1, UCMR3 databases, the tox profiles, what other states and federal um, organizations are looking at with regards to guidances and standards, and, and really just the general data availability at most of these AFFF sites. So the guidance is organized um, into a few different chunks, and these are the sorts of things that we look at in traditional ecological risk assessment. We're not rewriting the book on how to do an ecological risk assessment, but really trying to adapt PFOS to the existing framework. And we also had a bonus section on the lower right, really, when we went through all this information, we identified um, what are the current data gaps and research needs that, that ecological risk assessors and site managers working at the site level, what, what's the missing pieces that we really need right now from the research community? The guidance does have a threatened endangered species focus. We address threatened endangered species ecological risk. And we do have a little section or two on specifically what to do for threatened and endangered species ecological risks. But you know, we want to remind everybody that the information in the guidance is really broadly applicable to really any ecological risk assessment with common species. So we, it's transferable and usable at sites that don't necessarily have PNE species as a as a focus. One of the um, really main components we put together early in the in the guidance and go through is really what sort of conceptual site models would you consider at a a triple F site? Would you have aquatic systems or terrestrial systems that might be impacted? How does PFOS move through the system in terms of water, sediment, soil into the food web and present risks to higher level uh, aquatic? and terrestrial dependent wildlife. And we use this framework a little later in the bioaccumulation model and uptake exposure modeling that I'll, I'll walk through in a few slides. So in terms of the traditional ecological risk assessment paradigm, you know, really the first key technical focus of, of the work is to look at exposure and characterizing exposure. It, it, at site of interest. And a key part of that is building a food web model to predict or evaluate the concentrations of PFOS in diet items for wildlife in particular. Um, you know, to put really a database of values together for this exposure modeling step, we went through a large bibliography of studies. We put that into the guidance. We went through a process for selecting and identifying really what we thought were the best currently available recommended values for ecological risk assessments and then put those into tables and figures to present that information and you know it's the typical sorts of bioconcentration factors and bioaccumulation factors biomagnification factors that you use in a deterministic model um, building that up in an ecological risk assessment so what exactly am I talking about here? So this is an example of a BCF for forage fish, for example. And this is the information, you know, we, we have it in tables and in graph form so you can kind of understand. And, you know, in doing this, we have the particular values that the ecological risk assessors would find useful in plugging into the models. But also you can kind of start to see relationships um, across the different groups of 
PFOS, for example, you can see here there's sort of a log linear relationship with increasing bioconcentration for the longer uh, chain acids, for example. This is this is not exactly new, but it's nice to see it in graphic form for the various uh, uptake factors that we've compiled. One of the other key uh, parts of the exposure model um, work in the guidance was to come up with a bioaccumulation model framework, and this puts together some just basic models and suggested model parameters to, to work that up into an aquatic food web, um, starting with measured concentrations in the abiotic media like soil, sediment, and water. So I'll start working through this you know, step by step here. You, you often start an investigation with just measurements in the abiotic system. You may have concentrations in the stream and in water, um, you know, concentrations in sediment or soil. Uh, you know, it was great to hear the question earlier about organic carbon and sediment in soil. You know, really we recommend that's a good thing to have at these sites if you're going out to collect data that you get that carbon because um, it is useful for modeling and understanding. Um, uptake into the food web. Uh, so you start off with these sorts of measurements at a site and you can basically put that into the model and a key part of the model that next up in the in the chain here is really those uptake factors that I mentioned earlier, the bioconcentration, bioaccumulation, biomagnification, that you basic factors that you use to multiply by um, you know, concentrations in soil, water, for example, sediment to predict concentrations in, in key parts of the food web, um, things like invertebrates in, in the benthos, uh, fish, plants, and, and earthworms in terrestrial systems, for example. Those are really the key concentrations we're interested in modeling because um, we're using those concentrations to come up with total daily intake estimates for wildlife that are often the focus of many of the ecological risk assessments that we're dealing with. And again, those sorts of models, the wildlife models used are the traditional um, wildlife exposure models for ecological risk assessment. So in terms of effects, you know, once you have measures of exposure, predicted exposure uh, estimates for wildlife on a daily basis. You often want to know well, what are the potential effects, where are the thresholds um, in that. So part of the guidance that we looked at um, in terms of effects was basically, again, looking to the literature to see what information's out there in toxicological benchmarks and pulling together really a, a wide range of studies and, um, you know, wildlife, aquatic life, soil life, and coming up with sort of a standard way to look at those values and scoring them um, in terms of their usefulness and applicability to ecological risk assessments. And again, we have the sort of traditional tables and figures um, to summarize the values that we've selected for mammals, birds. We have aquatic life criteria based on species sensitivity distributions, um, criteria for soil and vertebrates and terrestrial plants. Um, this is an example of, of what that information looks like. These are mammalian toxicity reference values for mammals, um, really plotting across the different compounds that we're looking at where we had the information. I won't go into the details of, of the, the figure here, but um, suffice to say we, we looked at survival, growth, reproduction endpoints, identifying no L and low L TRVs that you would use for threat and endangered species risk assessments. We have really a pretty good discussion of each value and how it was derived so that, that information can be adapted to um, using on common species as well. Um, and really the, the take home when you put this information together, uh, you know, the longest PFCAs and PFAs tend to be really the most toxic. They have the lowest TRVs as you can kind of see from this figure. In terms of really the, the details, once we put those together, we, we take a step back in the guidance and say, what are some of the general ecological risk assessment recommendations that you have for sites? And we put those out there. And really the key take homes for, for that section, you know, you want to get good representative wildlife species um, for your site. Focus on um, really those species that are um, tend to be uh, have high site fidelity. These sites are often smaller. Um, they're not watershed level risk assessments in many cases. Many of the AIIIS sites are small. 
um, in terms of data needs and investigation approaches at sites, we recommend what sorts of environmental samples to collect. And at most sites, we recommend um, you know following a sort of a traditional phased approach for an ecological risk assessment, starting off with collection and analysis of abiotic samples like soil, sediment, and water, doing some initial modeling, and then evaluating the need for tissue sampling or other ecological studies um, based on those sort of modeling steps. And when it comes down to you know, risk characterization and, and uncertainty analysis towards the end of the ecological risk assessment process, we have some guidance and some thoughts on how to go about looking at risk when we have more than one PFAS at a site. And, and really, that's the rule here. And then what do we do about precursors or, or communicating and understanding risks of PFAS? It might be present but might not be detectable using the commercial analytical methods that are currently available to us. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about that we're working on right now is an ecological risk assessment modeling tool. We're actually putting the values that we've recommended in the guidance into a user-friendly ecological model that is in Excel, that is targeting um, folks who actually do ecological risk assessments where you can enter in your own data, you can fully customize it according to the wildlife that you might be interested in, you can change the parameters if you like. Basically, it's an off-the-shelf tool that you can start plugging in site-specific data and generating ecological uh, risk estimates, looking at uptake into the food web to understand um, your particular site-specific patterns of accumulation and, and risk. And we have uh, the aquatic model available now in beta version. We're working on the terrestrial model, and it should be uh, appearing soon on our CERTIP uh, project webpage. One of the, the byproducts of going through the, the guidance work and, and really um, came apparent as we start to put some of this information together is really we're able to identify key research needs and data gaps for the researchers out there, the, the folks um, like Marisol, you know, at the academic institutions putting the raw data and, and key studies out there. And so we put together some matrices of really data gaps and research needs and some of the key ones that we've identified, you know, we definitely need more toxicity studies, uh, especially for some of that stable acids for birds birds, invertebrates, um, terrestrial plants to really get a better idea on some of that information. We need really good models for terrestrial ecosystems. So, you know, we're working on that within this project, looking at biomagnification factors for transfers into upper trophic levels, particularly the small mammal and small bird to predator route is important to, to look at. Looking at PFAS precursors is, is important and how to evaluate that at some of these sites. Mixture toxicity is very important. Um, and then at the end, all of our laboratory data, our studies that we put together, um, and the model work that we do is incredibly important, but we need some good field ecology studies to go out to some of these AFFF sites, and test and validate the models that we're working at, the effect concentrations that we're identifying, and really test that against how the actual field organisms are responding at some of these actual impacted sites. Are we seeing the sorts of effects that we hypothesize from these laboratory and mesocosm experiments. Again, some of the ongoing efforts that we're working on this year, uh, we're, we're putting our model into Excel format. Again, the aquatic model is ready now in beta form. Terrestrial model is coming along very soon. Um, one of the other things I'm excited about is we're putting on training courses that do a very deep dive into the guidance. There are three to four hour training courses aimed at really the hardcore ecological risk assessors out there. We just put one on at the Emerging Contaminants Summit in Denver in early March. We videotaped that. It's going to be on YouTube. We're going to host that off of our project page. And, uh, and then we hope to reprise that uh, in uh, November at SeaTac in Fort Worth. We propose that to uh, the SeaTac meeting. So hope to see you there if you're interested in joining us for that workshop. We're also doing some short overview courses that get into a little bit more detail than I was able to today in the time that I had, uh, you know, presenting to a few audiences there. If you're interested in a webinar um, for your group, uh, please reach out. We can make that happen. They're generally one-hour webinars that get into a little bit more detail, again, than I was able to today. 
Um, so to wrap up, you know, ecoresc for PFOS and AFFS sites is possible. Um, you know, we can do it. It's ongoing now at many sites. Uh, lack of a perfect approach is not an excuse to delay actions and decisions at a lot of these sites, and we realize that. So we're, we're going forward with the best available information. Hope to update that as, as we go along. We have the guidance and model tools coming out and available now for DoD project managers and site-specific eco-risk assessors to be able to apply this information for decision at some of these sites. And then, you know, the data gap analysis, again, I, I really highly recommend if you're a researcher, you take a look at that. That's the sort of high priority information that, that folks like me really need at uh, the boots on the ground level to improve ecological risk assessments at sites. And some of the benefits to DOD, we're hoping this information is really going to make investigations that are ongoing now more efficient, provide some basis for dialogue with key stakeholders, really help move decision-making process along, and ultimately um, get to the point where we can delineate investigation areas at sites and potentially um, help identify the needs for management areas and, and management approaches to address potential ecological risks at sites. And again, you know, identifying those data gaps for, for program-wide research at, at these sites. I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge my uh, the great team of folks that I was able to work with, uh, Jen Arblister, Emily Larson, and Kristen Bridges, uh, Chris Higgins, Julianne Brown at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, this was definitely a huge team effort, and uh, thank you to my co-authors. And uh, I think that's all the slides I have. For more information, you can check out my project webpage or reach out to me directly. Thanks for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. We have a number of questions for you. The first one is from EPA Region 10. Have any of the predictions of the bioaccumulation model framework been validated or demonstrated or used at a site? Yes, um, that's a great question. You know, any good model needs to be validated and tested. In the uh, in an earlier publication we we put out in Chemosphere in 2019, we tested a few sites where we did have matched uh, abiotic and biotic data. That is, we had concentrations in sediment, water, for example, and also fish. So we plugged those abiotic data into the model to see how accurately the model predicted accumulation in the fish and aquatic food web, and it did pretty well. Um, not perfect, it's within, you know, a factor of two to five in many cases. We've tested it at other sites with other data sets, and that's generally the observation that we see. Um, that being said, we'd love more data sets to be able to test it. Um, you know, Marisol's data set from Clark's Marsh, that, that's a great um, opportunity to plug those numbers in and see if, if the model is predicting accurately what we see in the food web. So I welcome the opportunity to be able to do more work like that. Thank you, Jason. And Linda, please feel free to contact Jason at the email shown here to get a copy of that paper. Of course, Jason's uh, guidance document uh, is available on the uh, a sort of ESCCP uh, web, in, uh, web page for the project that is shown here. And that's where we're pushing all the tech transfer activities for the various PIs, including Mary Salt's work. So make sure you check, up, uh, check out their project numbers. Uh, this is a question from Lidos. Um, where, Jason, can someone access the beta versions of the EcoRisk tool? Yeah, right. Right now, you can uh, feel free to email me, and I'll happy to happy to share that with you. We hope to uh, be able to post it on our our uh, project webpage over the next month. But you know, to the meantime, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to uh, send it right to you. Looking for feedback on on how well it works. Um, you know, any suggestions you have, we're actively seeking that from the the, the community. So please reach out. Great, thank you, Jason. This is a question from US EPA, the Office of Water. Can you elaborate on how your data, reports, or models um, have been uh, peer reviewed? Yeah, the, the peer review process, we've um, part of the, the aquatic model was peer reviewed as part of the original manuscript. So, what we've put together here is based off of that model um, with some updates based on really the most available, most recent research. 
Uh, we also had some peer review from uh, Mark Johnson at U.S. Army and his colleagues also looked at the guidance document as well. And, you know, again, it, I think it's going to be, you know, this guidance or guidances like this are going to be a living document that um, I think we'll need to kind of continually revise and update and have conversations with uh, folks over the next few years as really the information really starts to come available on filling all those data gaps and research needs that we've mentioned. Thank you, Jason. Two more questions from EPA. The first one, does the guidance document provide descriptions of evaluation criteria for the data used in the Excel model? Yes, we have a, a detailed section on um, you know, the criteria that we use to recommend and select say the bioaccumulation factors, the toxicity reference values, we have a good discussion on really the key studies and, and how that was developed as well. Uh, the TRV selection process, for example, was based on US, EPA, pardon me, US EPA's EcoSSL's TRV selection criteria. Um, so again, you're welcome to look at that information. And again, one of the things that we also meant really highly stress in the document, if your site is different, as if an ecological risk assessor wants to dig into the original data, there's lots of information that we've compiled as part of our review. So if you disagree with our values, um, you're free to, to dig into that literature that we've cited. We provide some guidance on uh, really what's available and what's uh, in those, some of those papers. So. Thank you. The second question from EPA, where can one find data for field sample concentrations of PFAS at AFFF sites uh, for soil and groundwater. Yeah, that that's it's sort of a hodgepodge right now of, of sources. Um, one of one of the best sources that was peer reviewed, the uh, Anderson et al. paper from a couple of years ago, where they did a big. Uh, meta-analysis of Air Force AFFF sites that was put together by Hunter Anderson. I'd start looking there. That has some good data, uh, but really beyond that, it's on a site-by-site -site level, um, and many of the states, individual EPA regions are starting to report and post that information. Some of it's available in the peer-reviewed literature, like Mary Saul's papers. Um, so again, it's, it's a, getting, getting your arms around that is very challenging right now, but it is out there. Thank you, Jason. Um, did you consider uh, freshwater mussel species as a threatened and endangered species um, in your uh, guidance? Did you run across any papers citing these specific uh, organisms? Yeah, I, I, I want my memory is a little uh, shaky on this right now, but I believe we do have mussels. Um, one of the things I didn't have a chance to talk about today, but the aquatic life criteria screening values that we've developed are based on species sensitivity distributions. So we have a wide variety of, of aquatic uh, organism tox data that's built into that, and I'm, I'm pretty sure bivalves or mussels are in that data set, but I'd have to check. Thank you. And for the Excel tools in development, uh, especially when you're talking about uh, or trying to account for contaminants and mixture, are the different slopes of the dose response relationships accounted for? Yeah, so in, in reviewing the toxicity information, the TRV values, the benchmarks that we put into the guidance, we did look at the strength of the dose response relationship and, and many of the studies the dose response relationship is quite complicated and in the selected studies that we've identified for the model tool we walk through each study and the dose response that was in that paper so it's not a it's not a simple answer but again it's it's uh, really digging into the weeds behind each individual TRV and, and looking at that study so we have a little bit of information on that thank you are there any simple total PFAS chemical measurement that can help us understand potential risks at these sites, Jason? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when when we go to uh, a site with PCBs or, or petroleum 
uh, for example, we might we might take a soil sample and say, well, what's the total concentration of PCBs or total concentration of PAHs that might be in that soil or sediment, and come up with at least a, a general idea or a screening level idea of, of ecological risk. Um, unfortunately, there's just not a great tool out there just yet for for PFOS at AFFF sites, and I think that's going to be very challenging. Um, you know, that slide I showed earlier with the wide variety of chemical structures, these compounds are very diverse in their chemical structure. Uh, we're, all, we're used to looking at PFOS and PFOA, which to your eyeball look pretty similar with the exception of their functional group at the end. But at AFFF sites, you have a wide variety of chemical structures to deal with that are in that PFOS family. So coming up with something simple like a top assay or a piggy measurement or something like an extractable organofluorine measurement, um, it, it, it's, it's a tempting idea, but it's not going to be um, immediately helpful right off the bat right now. Um, it, we're going to have to do some work on that. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. At this point, I'd like to pull Mary Cole back into this discussion and ask you both to opine on some of the more general questions that we've received on a PFAS ecological risk assessments in general. So we'll start with you, Mary Sol. Can you share with us, based on your work, um, which PFAS you believe uh, tend to represent the highest ecological risks at AFFF impacted sites? Mary Sol? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we sure so can. I think, yeah, uh, and, and I would like Jason to also pitch in <laughs> answering this one, but I think it, based on our own research, it, that's a hard question to answer because we see effects uh, with chemicals that are not bioaccumulating, with PFAS that are not necessarily bioaccumulating. Uh, whether that's only true for amphibians, it's probably not the case. It's probably applicable to other vertebrate species and invertebrates. So, Based on just bioaccumulation data alone, it's, it's difficult to say which are the most um, critical PFAS. Nevertheless, PFOS always stands up as one of the most uh, toxic in general, um, also because it's, very, it's highly bioaccumulative. And so that's always the PFOS. Yeah, Marisol, is I, I think. Like, I... Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go no, ahead, ahead. Marisol. You, yeah, I was I was just going to say I was going to agree. You know, PFOS tends to be um, really leading the charge in terms of exposure at a lot of these sites. Um, you know, the, the case studies that we did as part of the the chemosphere paper, um, sites that I've worked with in the past 10 to 15 years, and other sites that we're working on now, uh, they tend to be really driven a lot by PFOS concerns, especially for for vertebrate wildlife, you know, mammalian and, and avian receptors at sites, PFOS just tends to be a high concentration of basically, you know, in the AFFF mixture itself, but it's also at a sweet spot in terms of its bioaccumulation and and uh, behaviors and ability to partition to soil and sediment and, and really bioaccumulate and hang around at a lot of these sites. Great, thank you both. Um, all right, another uh, question, and again, we'll start with Marisol before we move on to Jason. What are some of the common misconceptions, in your opinion, that project managers and other stakeholders tend to have about PFAS ecological risk? Marisol? Misconceptions? Um... I'm not exactly sure what what they're asking there, but I guess the fact that that um, I guess it's a very large family of of chemicals that perhaps some people believe that it's going to be very difficult or impossible to to be able to come up with um, uh, you know an idea of what's really happening in the environment because of the fact that they're so varied in, in structure and chemical structure and so forth. However, I think that there's still um, research, promising research out there that would suggest that we're going to be able to at least come up with some um, criteria for the major classes or families of these chemicals. 
So I, I, I don't know if that answered the question or not, but that's all I can think of right now. It's a good start, Mary Sol. Thank you. Jason, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, at a lot of the sites that, that we're working with, it, you know, I think a common misconception that we hear from stakeholders and clients and other folks involved in the process is that PFAS, uh, they're just water contaminants. You know, let's go out and get some water samples or we have some groundwater data. Um, but but I think I would really reinforce that from our own modeling work on our own experience, looking at the literature and other sites, um, I think aquatic sediment and terrestrial soil is still an important compartment to, to measure. Um, for example, the modeling work that we did at many of the sites, a lot of the PFOS that was accumulating through the food web is actually originating from sediment pathways rather than surface water pathways. Um, that's going to vary from site to site, of course, but, you know, really you can't ignore um, sediment right now, I think is kind of a main, uh, you know, answer that I give to that question. I think another, um, you know, misconception is that these compounds are um, somehow, you know, super toxic and the sky is falling. Um, but, you know, from the TRVs that we developed, the aquatic life criteria that we're working with, you know, there are other chemicals that are as toxic and more toxic than these stable acids. For example, you know, the, the DDTs can be more acutely and, and chronically toxic to aquatic life. Um, some metals can be more toxic to mammals and birds than PFOS, for example. Um, so these compounds are toxic. They do need to be managed. Um, but, you know, we don't have to rewrite the entire ecological risk book to be able to to do um, proper and, and smart assessments at these sites. Great. Thank you so much. One last question before we wrap up. Um, what, in your opinion, are the most critical data gaps in this field of work? Um, so as it relates to ecological risk assessment approaches at PFAS impacted sites, what are the data gaps? And we'll start with you again, Mary Paul. Yeah, I think one of the major data gaps right now is toxicity studies that evaluate, that are chronic in nature and evaluate uh, relevant endpoints such as uh, reproduction. Uh, there's a lot of data gaps, in particular taxonomic uh, groups like Jason was saying, birds. In particular, probably fish eating birds. And of course, uh, reptiles and amphibians are always lagging behind in terms of toxicity data in general. Uh, but more than anything, I think are those studies that are targeting um, things like reproduction and of course the mixture, mixture data. It's, it's, it's also uh, not very, there's not very much mixture to uh, PFAS toxicity data right now. That is a super important gap. Thank you, Marisol. That's great input. And Jason, we'll conclude with you. Yeah, I, I would echo, echo Marisol's uh, comment there about toxicity data. You know, getting good toxic effect benchmarks um, from these lab studies is really critical for evaluating these models and, and deciding what to do at sites. I think kind of adding on to that, um, mixture toxicity is incredibly important. Again, you know, we go to these sites and we're dealing with uh, you know, dozens of compounds that we can detect. When we come up with risk estimates, exposure estimates, uh, do we need, how do we account for the combined additive effects of these PFAS that may be present? Um, can we do that? Do we need to add them together? Is there more something, is there something more sophisticated that we need to be doing? Um, you know, evaluating quantitative structure activity relationships or QSAR sorts of approaches or other read across approaches that may allow us to uh, have some shortcuts for compounds that we may not be able to test with organisms. Um, you know, come up with some molecular and, and machine learning tools to try to predict effect values, predict accumulation factors, things like that. And I think kind of parting thought, um, you know, again, we need to put some more eco in the eco risk assessment, you know, go out and do some field studies at these sites to, to really see if we're having impacted populations and impacted communities at these AFFF sites? Do we see um, the degradation of resources that the laboratory data, the model data might be predicting? 
Great. I'd like to thank you both for um, a great webinar. Um, I'd like to remind our audience that our next webinar on Thursday, April 23rd, will feature CERDAP and ESCCP award-winning projects in the munitions response uh, program area. Uh, Dr. Stephen Cargill from the Applied Physics Laboratory at the University of Washington in Seattle will talk about results uh, from basic research conducted over a decade to understand physical mechanisms associated with scattering sound from objects near a water sediment boundary. Dr. Cargill will then discuss current efforts to transition the knowledge gained to an applied platform that integrates high-frequency side scan sonar, downward-looking low-frequency sonar, and an in-house signal processing package for munitions detection and classification. To register for this and the upcoming webinars that Andrea referred to, please feel free to visit our webinar webpage. Uh, before we conclude, I'd like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. At this point, we would appreciate it if you can please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for participating.